Washington's seventh spring practice is in the books. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back in to another edition of the Locked On Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. He writes for Inside the Huskies of Fan Nation Sports Illustrated. I'm the site editor over with Huskies Wire. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen today. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Down the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Lockdown College for $20 off your first purchase. Lars, we are recording this right after we got back from Washington's most recent spring practice. That would be number seven. And, you know, it wasn't necessarily the most eventful practice, I should say. We can, you know, start off with just the highlights, like obviously Denzel Boston, fantastic as always. But I feel like the biggest place to start before we get into some of the transfer portal stuff that we might have been hearing when we were out there, just we'll, we'll break some of that down a little bit, was Pete Carroll. Pete Carroll came out today for practice, but it was a little bit different than all of the other coaches, general managers, everybody else that we've seen at, at practice. Yeah, exactly. Where everyone else had kind of some sort of fanfare, right? Where whether intentional or otherwise, you know, Jack Del Rio was clearly brought in for a couple of days to either be around the team. Obviously his son, Luke Del Rio is an analyst on the team. So I'll be around his son as well. When Bill Belichick came in, it was again, already going to be a pre-planned about five day visit. Pete Carroll, you have to remember, as being the Seahawks head coach, he just lives in the area so he can be a fan, which, by the way, was kind of the perfect embodiment of, hey, you can literally just show up to practice. Literally, Pete Carroll strolls in and just walks down the ramp by the East practice field, walks in wearing some sunglasses, goes all the way down, ends up walking all the way back, and just right near kind of the entrance and exit where fans – by the way, fans, we're talking like if you're a student on campus, whether you're – yeah, you know, it's, it doesn't matter who you are. Like, literally, you can just walk in. That's what Jed Fish is doing for fans this spring. And some people take advantage, some people don't. But for those that did, they would see Pete Carroll was literally just standing watching, watching the offensive line when, when they were breaking off into individual drills, but just watching the scrimmage, just, kind of, just hanging there. I mean, Dick Baird, the former Husky and Cougar coach, came over and talked to him a little bit. Look, there were a couple of other – you know, people that at some point made their way up to say hello. Um, but then also there was just some fans where you could just kind of hear whispers where, oh, his son's the offensive coordinator. It's like, yeah, he's just being a dad. Like literally like Justin Hilkema's, um parents were there at practice. And so it, yeah. no, literally no different. Like, hey, we're just here to watch our kid. And granted, obviously um, Justin's not able to practice yet. But with that being said, it's again, just an example of, hey, Jed Fish is really opening this thing up. And you literally, and to the 33rd team's point, you never know who could pull up at practice. But, yeah, Pete was literally didn't even go on the field, didn't go and shake Jed's hand, just wanted to see what practice was like. Yeah. He, uh, to, shout out to Christian Capel, who he and I were talking about a little bit over on the sideline in front of the pod. And he he was just like, yeah, he looks like a, like a little league dad. Just kind of here hanging out because he, he spent a lot of time watching his son, watching the offensive line. But, again, just – from a distance, not like getting involved. And it's something where Jed Fish has said he'll be involved at some point. We'll kind of see what that looks like whenever we, we know a little bit more about that, but it was just, it was fun to see that. It was like, Oh, Hey, look, there there's Pete Carroll. And Lars, with that being said, we did talk about it a little bit, jumping into some of the, the meat of practice. Denzel Boston just had another fantastic day. And I feel like every day now he's trying to one up himself with another just fantastic catch in between multiple defenders or just going over the top of somebody. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to find out where is Denzel Boston's peak? Because at some point, one of these plays is going to have to, you know, when we go back and rank the top 10 Denzel Boston catches of the 15 spring practices or 14 plus the spring game, we at some point are going to have to rank them. So have we seen yeah. the best one yet? I mean, again, we probably have, but then every single day there's another one and where the one today, for example, where we, we made the joke of, okay, who are we crediting that being on oh, just the left, the right side of the defense or the left side of the break, depending on your angle, which side you're looking at the far side of the field, like who, whoever the three quarterbacks on the far side of the field, that's who it was on. Pick your boys. And it really doesn't matter because they all three are responsible at the end of the day. But it's just the, every single day Denzel keeps just making play after play. And, again, I, I, I asked you at practice, and I was like, has Denzel really, like, had a withdrawal from the bank? He keeps making deposits. And it's like, yeah, he had the fumble, to your point, and he had a couple of other, you know, instances throughout camp. But, I mean, the amount of d deposits that he's making into the bank, he can have a couple of those withdrawals every now and then. And it's like, oh, wow, Denzel, you know, had a fumble. It's like, yeah, but did he have a drop? No, maybe maybe he could have secured it better or whatever. But, you know, 
nobody's perfect, but the fact that we're talking about Denzel Boston in the same light that I feel like we were talking about Roman Dunze and Jalen Polk and Jalen McMillan yeah. going into last season, it's like we, we probably at some point should temper the expectations just a little bit out of fairness to him. But at the Absolutely. same point, the more, the, but the more he keeps producing, the less of a reason there is to do that. Right, because on the other side of that coin, you're you're right. There, expectations certainly need to be tempered for somebody who has, I, th- I think it's nine career catches at this point. But on the, like you said, every single day he's doing something new, and it feels like every single day he's the number one topic of what we're talking about. And we're not doing that because it's like, oh, this is somebody we need to hype up. This is somebody who we really like for reason A, B, or C. No, it's just that's what we're seeing every single day. He's doing something new. He's doing something spectacular. He's making plays. He's looking like the best, not best receiver. He looks like the best player on the field. And it's something where we talked about him a lot last spring, last fall. And it was, wow, he's making a lot of plays. He looks really good, especially last fall. He looked absolutely fantastic. And then... You know, he had a little bit of a minor thing uh, just in terms of a a minor injury that I remember just seeing about halfway through fall camp where it looked like it limited him for a little bit. And then, you know, the season rolls around and you're sitting behind those three guys that you mentioned, plus Jeremy Bernard, plus Devin Culp and Jack Westover, who are used as pass catching options, plus every once in a while, Dylan Johnson getting a target here and there. So there weren't really a ton of options for him to actually get on the field. And now that he has that opportunity, he's running with it, man. And it's so cool to see. It's so awesome to see. Yeah, exactly. And that, that, that's the thing is like, we're not just, I mean, literally, I mean, you kind of personified it perfectly where I asked you like, Hey, what are you, what are you writing down in the notes today? Cause again, the, you can clearly tell even before practice, Scotty Graham was wearing a hat, not a headband. So you kind of already knew, <laughs> okay, today's going to be a mild back, a little dial back day. Just right. Cause again, now we're halfway through spring camp. If you think about it, look at the first seven days of practice or first seven practices. And then you look at the last seven days of practice leading up to the spring game on May 3rd um, on that Friday, you kind of naturally want to have those PC valleys where like, okay, you don't want to keep ramping up every single day because by the time you get to practice 10, 11, 10 through 15, they're either pretty spent or it's almost like the end of a season, right? Where you're like, wow, like right. hang on a minute. Like we, we don't need to be going always like this we can kind of you know find a poncho and then see if we can go back up again and then when we get back to the spring game probably somewhere in the middle right and and i feel like that's one thing we should note that there were a couple of guys that looked like were held out for for just minor injuries didn't look like anything major and one of the reasons that we just kind of you know put two and two together here with why it was a low intensity day was even though the offensive line is already somewhat light uh pocky finau and kaylee tafai both didn't practice today doesn't appear to be anything major they were both out there on the field just kind of in street clothes and it's just something where all right it seems like jed fish said we're not going to go as hard today they did a lot of seven on sevens they weren't making the offensive linemen stay out there and take a whole bunch of extra reps so that i feel like that's one thing that we should note but Lars, with that being said there's still a whole lot more to talk about plus the transfer portal And we'll get there right after a message from our friends over at Monopoly Go. We've all been there, either as a player or a fan. It's halftime and the scoreboard is not looking good. You're feeling low, not sure you or your team can pull out a win. That's when you dig deep. You lift your head up and say to yourself, time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heists, and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right, the smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone, anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards, compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do. You can play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards. You can make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball. You can charge other players rent for your iconic properties. You can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb the leaderboard. So get back out there and put on your game face and you can download Monopoly Go, which is now free on the App Store or Google Play. So, Lars, we've we've heard some rumors and something we we, we talked about a little bit. A couple of the guys that, that didn't dress or weren't spotted at practice today down at Arizona. I feel like this is the only logical place for us to start here. Uh, Takario Davis did not dress, showed up to practice late. An interesting one is we've got a lot of questions about Takario Davis where, you know, we, we hadn't heard anything. We still haven't heard anything. But didn't practice today showed up late and this is after he has never officially taken his name out of the transfer portal. 
So we're just going to leave it at that because we're not going to speculate. We're not going to go too far down that road. But another player who did enter the transfer portal and took his name out is offensive lineman Raymond Polito. And that's another one who was not there today. We'll see what happens. We talked about him a little bit on the show yesterday. But it, uh, Arizona insiders have hinted that, you know, there might be some other guys coming up here to Washington from that roster. We'll see. But right now, those two look like very, very possible names. Right. I mean, obviously, any offensive lineman with or without Arizona ties, if they have experience starting and their interest in Washington, yeah, but that, that one makes sense. The, the kind of – not the other one or the odd one, but it's it's Takario Davis, right? Where from – you kind of have to un, – let's unpack it a little bit, right? Because when you look at Takario Davis as a player, absolutely, anybody in the top 25 would love to have him, right? If you need or even don't need a cornerback – yeah, you're pretty much going to get an improvement on whoever is already on your roster. And that's no disrespect to who's on your roster, right? But when you look at some schools, and especially Washington, there's there's some depth there we like. We've seen from Jordan Shaw, Thaddeus Dixon has competed in the fall camp, or spring ball, as has Eliza Jackson. But then Eliza Jackson kind of gets has a, we'll just say kind of like a n- nagging injury. It doesn't look severe, right? No, it, it doesn't. It doesn't look serious. Yeah. Where, where, whereas at least he's out of practice where there was another player who wasn't even out of practice today, not because he's going in the portal, but because. Of yeah. Let's hold on. Let's, let's address that now. Yeah, Zach Durfee was not out there at practice today. We talked about it the other day where we saw him uh, leave the field a little bit early with an injury. And so if that's, that's just all we can probably say on the matter right now. We'll see kind of what that looks like. We don't have any, any kind of information on that right now. But for anybody who is saying like, Oh, well, Zach Durfee wasn't out there. Doesn't appear to be transfer portal related. As he said to us when we spoke to him last week, I don't want to go through that again. So I, I highly doubt that's what's going on there. I'm pretty sure he added another four letter word in between that, but yeah, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Cause I, because again, yeah, Zach, it's, it no sounded he, like it. Yeah. Right. Right. Where there's no chance he's doing that again, but yeah, just to clarify, but getting back to the, the cornerback room, right. No, probably aside from features price stock, and this is no disrespect to Elijah Jackson. This is just when you look at the body of work, what they've done over three, four years, or even two, three years. Takario Davis is better than any quarterback on Washington's roster that will be returning, right? And that's with no disrespect to De- Devon Banks. That's with no disrespect to Elijah Jackson or Thaddeus Dixon or any of the up and covers that you want to pick out. But look at what Takario and appreciates price stock did at Arizona. And then look at Washington. Yeah. That's all I'm going to yeah, say. And- and it's something we've talked about before. If you want Steve Belichick's scheme to run perfectly, if you can have two guys that you can just leave out on islands that are six foot four, run really well, have super long arms, and love to play press band coverage, everything else is going to be so easy. Like I and I, I don't mean that in terms of like, oh, all of a sudden they're going to be the best defense in college football. No, but it it's it makes everything else flow so easily, and it allows you to do so many things scheme wise. So if there's still a possibility of that happening, that's that would be obviously a no no brainer of a take. And I I think that Takario would be better than Brysock. Honestly, I love both those players. I think they're both fantastic. But I'm going to go with the guy who was on the all Pac-12 second team over the honorable mention. They're both fantastic players, Lars, as you said. I would just give Takario a slight edge there. But those are some of the transfer portals rumors we're hearing as of right now as we record this on 8.30 on, on Tuesday night. And we're going to keep up to date on all of that as much as we possibly can because that's going to be such an important piece of this team. And as, as we said, as we alluded to right before the break, with some of the offensive linemen going down, you talked about Justin Hilkema being uh, on campus for a visit. Uh, it's somebody who's already signed, and obviously he can't practice, but just looking at the size of him, he's a fantastic player to watch on film. I know our buddy Ben Glassmeyer loves watching his film, and you just need to make sure that more bodies are in the room. And it's going to happen, and it feels like there are going to be some really, really quality bodies as well. Right, and I think especially the offensive line, but there's a couple of other positions as well where it's not just short-term bodies, right? Where Justin Huckham, obviously coming from high school, four-year player, right? That you're just planning out four years, probably five, right? But just, just yeah. quantify the next four. But then some of these other positions where when you're looking at like a Marcus Bryant, right, who, which we talked about on uh, Monday's show and, and even earlier, honestly, before that. But I don't know if we talked about him on Friday's show, but I'm pretty sure we've talked about him at length on a couple of shows. We where, definitely have. Where, where, where that's a one-year rental, right? So you want to be able to have a mixture of guys, right? Where Washington offered a redshirt freshman LSU as Jackson Howard. 
yeah. right after practice. So it's one of those where the coaches aren't just zeroing in on, you know, the jurors of parties with guys that have one or two years of experience. There's one or two years of eligibility left and more so the one year guys. It's you also want to balance that out with, hey, to your point about the Arizona transfer from Northwestern, where, hey, you had a you had a redshirt freshman who didn't play at all last year, but we liked the relationship. We like the projectability. Again, Steve Belichick on defense, Brandon Carroll on offense, both those coaches. That's one word they will just always have. But probably every other answer is projectability, you know, not. Not a little bit different from coachability, right? Because coachability is more your attitude. Projectability is okay. Right. Where can I put you? Because we've seen Brendan Carroll this, this past this spring. You're pretty much playing all five positions if you are listed as an offensive line. Absolutely. And so with that, I want to mention one more name that was not seen at Arizona's practice. That you know we'll kind of see what happens. And this one is is definitely very notable. And that's offensive lineman Matthew Lado who two of his teammates or his former uh, high school teammates are already up here in Adam Muhammad and Michael Watkins. So he was another, just another offensive lineman played left tackle down there for Apollo high school. And that's another guy who would definitely be a very interesting take, as you said, Lars with a whole bunch of eligibility remaining. And that would really round out this class of true freshmen gives Brennan Carroll a whole lot of young bodies to try to develop. And then, you know, you can try to go after some of the upperclassmen as well. A name that it, it does sound like right now is an Arkansas lean, but is starting to get a little bit more attention over the last couple of days is SMU center Branson Hickman. That's a guy that I've been keeping really close tabs on. Love to see what happens with that one. And there's, there's just so many other names that we haven't seen hit the portal yet, but We'll see what happens, and that's that's really all you can say on on that matter for right now. But Lars, I I feel like another just position that we need to just continue to discuss when it comes to all this is wide receiver, where it's beyond Denzel Boston, it's beyond Jeremiah Hunter, where that's a position where one maybe even two bodies would be really helpful, an upperclassman and maybe a redshirt freshman or a sophomore or somebody with a lot of eligibility remaining, and. I mean, the we're not going to get any rumors about you know bigger players that may or may not also be in Arizona uh, that 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 were that were thrown out there. I I can't say I believe those, but I just I think that that's one position where the more we look at it, there's a lot of really nice players in the room: Aldrick Harris, Jason Robinson, some of these other younger guys we haven't gotten to see yet, like Justice Williams, and then of course we talk about the headliners all the time: Denzel Boston, Jeremiah Hunter. But I'm just really curious to see what else could happen there. Yeah, I don't disagree because when you look at the math and kind of how the room shakes out, you still technically haven't replaced Jeremy Bernard, right? Because you did bring in Audrey Harris, but he's a true freshman who was an early enrolling signee in Arizona. You did bring in Jeremiah Hunter, right? I'm sorry, I, I just I just want to I want to stop you for one second. Just I I've, so I have a question about that. When you say replace Jeremy Bernard, do you mean from a standpoint of body type and role, or do you just mean where he was lined up and what he was asked to? do like just more more so role or more so that player more so role in terms of but also eligibility right okay, where he had a couple more we well, had a couple right but i think but it, it, to me more the answer is yes right where it's not just his role right because i don't think the role is necessarily the problem i think it's more so do you have that middle guy because jeremiah hunter is an older guy paired with giles jackson so you now have a couple old guys that are going to leave after this year denzel is that guy but to your point, if you want that's to really not, bolster that, that's that's sorry, no, that, 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 that's not where I'm going with that. I was going to say Keith Reynolds, where he's somebody where we've seen him line up all over the place, where we saw Jeremy lined up in the backfield taking handoffs. I think that's something if you wanted Keith to do, he could do it. But I just I like his flexibility. I I don't think he can play on the outside very often, but you can certainly line him up there and see what happens. He can play a lot in the slot like Jeremy did. It felt like Jeremy was getting ready to move to the outside, but he's such a nice mismatch in the slot where I feel like Keith can do that just in a very different way. And you could say the same thing about Rasheed Williams, where I don't think he has necessarily the the flexibility to line up anywhere in the formation in terms of in the backfield taking handoffs or anything like that. Or what and one thing I I not even go down the road of the Tyree kill just kind of in the move tight end role where I think Keith Reynolds would actually be really fun in that, but that's a whole other conversation for a whole different day. But I like seeing Rasheed Williams line up in the slot, which is something we discussed. He can line up on the outside. So I hear your point. I, di- I disagree, but that being said, that doesn't discount the need for a body. Right. And I think that's more or less just what type of body are you trying to find? Do you want the guy yeah. that's another, do you want another Jeremiah, which I don't think you need. Do you get, 
try and go find another Jeremy, right? Where it's again, he's not coming back from Alabama. Let me be clear about that. But you just kind of go look for somebody in that mold, right? Where it's a couple of years left, who's got some experience, but maybe probably could use a new, fresh, new offense to kind of really pop as a as a junior or sophomore, as it were. Or do you want to just go younger even more and just say, hey, we want a guy with four years experience. We're just going to try and max out what he's got, which that one doesn't really seem like it's going to be out there in this in this transfer period. No, definitely not. And with that being said, we still got a whole lot to get to from practice itself, but we had to make sure we hit on the transfer portal too. And we'll get there right after a message from our friends over at Yahoo Finance, because this couldn't exist without the help of our friends over at Yahoo Finance. When it comes to your financial future, you think you've done it all. You've saved, you've researched, you've invested all that you can. Now you need to take those investments to the next level by using what every financial great uses, Yahoo Finance. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. Whether you're a seasoned investor or you're looking for that extra guidance, Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and data you need in one place. They are the number one finance finance destination, producing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, including breaking news, original editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. You can securely link your brokerage accounts for a unified view of your wealth, including 401k and other investments. A comprehensive perspective is what sets apart great investors, and it's how Yahoo Finance ensures you have the insight to look at your wealth in its entirety with a community of over 90 million users each month. Their real strength is helping you on your way to financial success. For comprehensive finance news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That's yahoofinance.com. So Lars, I, it's, it's something we we've, we hit on a little bit already this week, but I want to talk a little bit more about Isaiah Ward and Russell Davis where we talked about them at the end of yesterday's show. We had a fun discussion about pass rushers, roles, all that sort of stuff. But I'm just really excited about those guys and how they're going to fit in with this defense and the rest of the edge group, where I feel that they can do a little bit of everything. You you alluded to Isaiah Ward traveling a little bit outside of just lining up in the wide nine or in a seven technique or, or anything else like that, where he'll travel all the way out into the nickel with, with certain players, mainly running backs or tight ends. And... I just love his his athleticism. I love the versatility we've seen from him. And I, I'm just really curious to see what the next step for him and Russell Davis is going to be because it felt like they were going to be a really big part of Arizona's defense this year if that coaching staff was still there and that all stayed together. But now I feel like they might have to take a slight step back in terms of snaps, but that might just help keep them fresher and give them even a slight uptick in production. Yeah, well, it's almost like it's not necessarily a step back; it's a step sideways, right? Where you're kind of like, "Hey, just take a pause." That's you're, fair. You're still you're kind of going to be right there. You're not like you're not falling into that third, fourth team role, right? Where you're kind of like, "Hey, your scout team will figure what you're going to do in a couple of years." Like, no, no, we, we still need you. It's just this defense, I think it's because while the base is simple, the not simple, but the base is kind of what we can call it. There's so much multiplicity on it that that's why you're kind of going to – it's almost going to be almost game to game, right, where some games their style of play is going to, you know, fit more what UW wants to do on defense against a certain team. So they might see like 20, 25, 30 snaps in that game, but then the next two games combined they might only get 25 or 20, right, where it's just it's just going to come dependent on, I think, which I think if you're a player and what you want to be developed into, it's not the worst thing in the world because then you still have 25 to grow and even do more things like that and get even more snaps, right? When some of these other guys, you know, Zach Durfee and others and, and a number just a number of defensive guys across that board graduate out, right? Where but once you're getting that type of NFL coaching in college, like, okay, I, it's worth the progression, knowing that by the time I leave here. NFL teams will say, oh, he can do that and that and that. He did the last two more so recently, but he's shown over his co- the course of his college career with NFL coaching that he actually could do three or four different things. Right. And I'm sorry, I, I want to switch gears here a little bit because there's one other person that we need to talk about a little bit on the other side of the ball who just looks like he's making a big impact. And that's freshman tight end Decker DeGraff where we probably should have mentioned him a little bit earlier too, where he had a really, really nice day today. He had a nice touchdown grab and 11s from Will Rogers. 
And he's somebody who you and I have talked about a little bit where the tight end room is open and up for grabs. And we definitely need to talk about adding a transfer at that, at that position as well. But that's something we're probably going to say for another day. Once, you know, we see what kind of bodies are in the, just in the transfer portal at the position. But I, th- I think Decker might be the number two tight end right now. Yeah, I mean, I said that as a half joke to you. Or Mike Decker got tight end too, yeah. because obviously, because obviously, Quentin Moore. I think it's pretty clear he's the one, right? He is. Yeah. You know, even if, I think even if you bring in a transfer, sort of maybe let's say three or four tight ends in college football right now, that would be considered. Hey, like he comes in, he's a grade A starter. Quentin Moore is now your two. I think Quentin's shown he. Hey, I, I can do a number of things. I I can do a number of things well. I can't do one thing great, but I can do enough to be your solid first tight end option. Decker's right there in terms of, I think, no question, he's better as a pass catcher. He's certainly able to run. He caught the first touchdown of the, of the day in 11 on 11 from Will Rogers wide open. I mean, it was kind of one of those, like, wait, who? Yeah, he how, ran up the what, seam like, real nice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and, and, he look, and he looks crisp when he's running his routes, but I think we kind of knew that about him. And it's not that he's not a willing or a capable blocker, but I just think as a route, he's probably more polished or more developed as a pass catcher than as a blocker. I know he did, uh, was it Glendora, right? Or Glendale? It's Glendora, right? Glendora, yeah. Yeah, Glendora, that he obviously did have to do some pass blocking, but it wasn't as much, and certainly I think in this offense, what he's going to need to do. But I do think for, again, the, to get the freshman on the field, there might be like two or three packages they could use him in, right? Where it's just, hey, yeah, don't worry about blocking. Just, just We need you on these couple of plays. Just go for it. And if anything, if you can get that production, it's almost kind of to a degree what we saw from um, Josh Gravis uh, last year, right? Where it's sure. like, there's not a, yeah. where we where we thought there was going to be way more usage based on what we saw in practice, but then when it came to game time and Grub kind of you know scrunched the thing up and kind of tightened, opened it up just a little bit on game day, where it's like, hey, we, this oh, this offense is way more open than what it should be, what, what it right. what it looks like, but. I guess that was it, that one like 50, 34 yarder that he had for the, for the touchdown where it's like, hey, one catch, yes. 30 some odd yards and touchdown. That's kind of what Decker might have to do. I And I, I can certainly see a, a role where that happens because he's he's already somewhat, uh, I would say, developed as a pass catcher. And that that kind of brings brings me to the last point that I had written down for for today. And it's something I I, I noted in a, in a tweet about Robert Bala as well, where I just love watching this coaching staff coach where there are so many really fun, really energetic coaches. And whether we're listening to Vinny Sanceri, Robert Bala, John Richardson, Kevin Cummings, Scotty Graham, like uh, just those are the five that like I can think of right off the top of my head that are, oh, I can hear those guys wherever I'm standing on the field. And there's so much energy and there's so much fun. Like I love the way like Kevin Kim- Kevin Cummings and John Richardson go at each other when it's when it's one on one. They're you know they're yelling at each other, yelling at their guys. They're trying to get everybody really into it, and it's fun just how much energy this coaching staff has. Like we saw the the competitive like special teams drills that they were doing, where somebody had to try to get in front and block as as somebody else who was started a little farther back was sprinting down the field. And there's a lot of fun just competitive energy about this team and this coaching staff. And I just got to say that Jetfish has done a really, really good job putting it all together. Yeah. And I'm I'm glad you mentioned Vinny Sinceri, right? Because to your point about, we listen to everything. Tony Kashikon, obviously friend of the program, great broadcaster, was was introducing himself to Vinny after we had our media kind of, you know, get together with him. And he, and he actually very audibly heard, I'm assuming Tony told him his last name. He was like, Hey, Paisan. And I'm just like, yes, I needed that. I needed that. Um, but no, but, but it, to, to the point about that is when we got to talk to Vinny after Tuesday's practice, you could kind of see why Jed brought both him and Belichick with him, right? Where it's like, okay, Belichick, no disrespect to Vinny. Belichick's the architect, right? Belichick's going to put it up on the board and put it all together, but he's not necessarily going to be the greatest, hey, go get me these guys, right? Because if I'm going to be here for two or three years, I can't just coach up the guys that I have right now and make a couple calls in the portal. Like we, we've seen Belichick do some recruiting, right? But I think it's pretty clear. And I told you this a couple of times in practice where Vin is the one driving Belichick's riding shotgun when they do those recruiting trips. And they're going to find a way to get some dudes because I think that combination of the, they're both young, right? But when you look at Belichick and you listen to him talk, you're like, Oh yeah, it sounds like his dad. He's he's smart. He's and it's not that Vinny's way younger or anything. But you can kind of see Vinny was the former NFL player who Dyson McCutcheon looked up and, his, his game tape and stuff like that. It's like hey, like and can, the, it's the balance of them together is the key. 
No, absolutely. Well, so one other thing on that note, uh, I can't remember who asked, but they asked a really good question about recruiting after being in the NFL for a couple of years. And he said, it's something my dad's done for forever. It's something my brother's doing. So it's something I love to do. I love developing relationships with these kids. It's something I, I'm just really passionate about. And that was such a great answer because exactly as you said, it just ties it all together really well. And Lars, with that being said, we're going to jump out of here for today. As always, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all the everydayers for tuning in. We really do appreciate your support. It means so much to us. We love hearing it when people come up to us at practice and just say, hey, yeah, no, we listened to the show. I, that, it's, it's always really cool to see that and just see how much this has grown. As we're not even a year into this. And it's it, it just really does mean so much to us. We really do appreciate every little bit of it. And if you're new to the channel, hey. Welcome. Great to have you here. Please make sure you subscribe if you like the content and keep coming back because we will be updating this channel every single day and you can subscribe wherever you get your podcast, whether that's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, we're there. We're everywhere updating this channel with new content every single day. So please make sure to like the channel, like the video, leave us a comment down below. Uh, if you've got any questions, comments, concerns, anything like that, click that little bell so you never miss when we post a new video. And if you're audio only, please leave us a five-star review as it does help us out so, so much. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will talk to you on Thursday.